Yes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, our History Taste Today session. I'm Ang Harrod, and I'll be the host for today. Mm -hmm. So today we'll hear from La Dr. Lars Lahman, who is a senior lecturer in the history of China, and Dr. Andrea Yanku, head of history. And they'll be talking about epidemics in history. And we'll also have Daniel Sabir, who is a current history student at SOAS. So if you have any questions about what's it like studying here, then you can ask that in the chat and um, that will be answered for you. Okay, then I, so if you can yes, hear me, that's disappear. fine. I just had the impression nobody could hear me. So if you can, I, I just um, uh, go with what I wanted to introduce to you. So the second slide, if it appears on your screen, as I said, I just would like to, I mean, welcome mm -hmm. you and briefly introduce the departments. I've put all the photos of, of colleagues together so that you can get an, an, an idea of who you will meet uh, should you decide to come uh, to SOAS to study history. Um, so this is um, maybe just to highlight, um, I, I've, I've been a bit unfair to some colleagues. Um, so we have Roy Fischel, uh, who has his email address there, uh, who is, um, a uh, historian of early modern South Asia. And the, the reason why I highlight him, he's the convener of the BA history program. So if you have any questions about the program in particular, would like to get in touch with somebody, um, uh, Roy might be the person to ask apart from uh, Lars, uh, my colleague who you've already met, uh, who is our recruitment officer, uh, or you can also um, get in touch with me. So this is the three people uh, for which you have email contacts on these slides. And if the slides, but obviously you can also find them on the homepage anyway. Um, I did ask um, on the second slide, where are you joining us from? I've already seen your answers in the chat. So maybe we can skip that one. Uh, so that I leave some, some time for Lars um, uh, later on. I'm really happy to see that you're coming from so many different places. That's absolutely fantastic. And I wanted to say two words about um, the kind of history that um, we teach and study at SOAS, because we've often had people say, why don't you do a pro program in, in global history? Because that's what you do. And our answer is that's not quite what we do, uh, even though we're looking at many different places in the world that um, maybe um, a regular history program at other universities won't, won't necessarily cover in that kind of detail. Um, so we are looking at all kinds of places across the globe, um, but not from a Western perspective, but, but uh, all the colleagues of uh, whom you saw photos in, um, at the beginning are studying particular regions outside of Europe um, and, um, and America and the Western world. So the, the thing we are really proud of is, is that we do um, actually understand and study the, the cultures and the languages um, of the places whose history we are looking at. Um, and uh, one, one of the key points of interest in, in a way, and uh, one of the, obviously the areas that's become increasingly important um, and, and relevant today is, is to look at, at global encounters from perspectives um, that are not Western and trying to, to understand um, how different cultures and people met each other. So, so it's, it's understanding the world from different perspectives really. And, and that you can, you can see that from, some of the work um, that colleagues have produced. So the next slide is about, um, is introducing a um, couple of books that have been published um, in the last couple of years uh, by colleagues in the department. Um, so it's um, obviously topics such as uh, slavery um, in um, the, the Atlantic slave trade, um, colonial rule in Africa, but also looking at pre-colonial um, non-European countries, pre-colonial South Asia, uh, which is um, the area that uh, Roy Fish is particularly interested in, uh, or if you want to move further on about the Hindu family emergence of modern India um, in a more recent period where, where you have all these, um, uh, these tensions and ambiguities that um, emerge from those cultural um, encounters that I mentioned earlier. Um, so, so the point is to emphasize these different um, perspectives um, and try to understand a variety of different opinions and views about um, what, ha what is happening um, in the world and, and today even um, and how this came about uh, in the course of a longer history. Um, the next slide gives you, a, so the next part of what I want to say just in a few minutes is to talk a bit about 
the history program um, that we teach. Um, obviously, you have in the first year these kind of um, introductions to the discipline um, and historical approaches that you probably find um, in, in any history program. But, but some of the things that we've added to the program um, since about, I think, two years ago, that's when, when uh, my colleague Eleanor Vegan started teaching uh, this module called Colonial Curricula, Empire and Education at SOAS and Beyond. And I've highlighted this because in a way it kind of stands for what is um, different about SOAS um, and uh, what, what is a partic particular challenge, I think, for, for us in, um, as, as SOAS, as you might be aware, is, is an institution that emerged from, I mean, is, is part of the history of empire, very much so. And, and, and you can see that um, in uh, the coat of arms that, that you can still find in the school, um, that, um, I mean, knowledge is power, right? So this is really um, an institution that was meant to train people to uh, to work for um, uh, for 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 Britain in its um, uh, imperial enterprise, basically. Uh, but on the other hand, you see that there were a lot of people who came from um, the colonized countries who were studying and um, and and teaching at SOAS, and you have from from the beginning a very diverse um, uh, uh, group of people that, that come together and, and bring uh, views and opinions uh, to, to this debate that are quite different uh, from uh, a purely colonial perspective on, on what is happening in the world. Um, and, and, and this is um, obviously a debate that's um, very um, relevant today, it's very active, very lively, and it is, it's very much pushed also by SOAS students um, in many different um, bodies at the school. And, and this is one of the reasons why we now have integrated uh, this module that looks at SOAS history, uh, the history of education generally throughout um, the last century mainly. Um, and is kind of, I think a very good um, basis to engage in a critical study um, of the history um, of, of the world and, the, and how it became the way it is today and maybe also encourage thinking about um, what we can do um, to, to change it in ways that we think might, might, be, might make it a better place. Um, so I've just kind of randomly added some other titles of, of modules that we'll, we'll be running next year, uh, such as um, South African Apartheid, um, Nationalism, Identity in South Asia, Political Islam. It's, it's just to, to give you some, some kind of idea um, of what we are doing and what we hope um, will be attractive for you. Um, we are also trying to uh, go a bit be beyond the, um, the, the narrow confines, I guess, of, of, of the teaching curriculum um, and started before the disaster with the pandemic started last, the year before last, uh, to, um, to launch um, a project called um, which was meant as, as the beginning of a series of projects that then got interrupted, unfortunately, by, by the pandemic, what we hope to be able to pick up on this next year, uh, Decolonizing History, where we invite, invited um, uh, young playwrights uh, from very diverse backgrounds to, to join us, to join our classes and seminars and um, in, engage with students and in that dialogue develop um, audio plays about um, the, the histories that we study at SOAS and the way we study history at SOAS of these two perspectives. And uh, the result of that was uh, five um, short audio plays um, uh, that we then, um, where we had kind of um, uh, gathered listen listenings. Um, it's kind of um, a new invention of a public event by um, the artistic director of the uh, theater company that cooperated with us in, in this project. Um, so we, we try to um, kind of um, add more of these kinds of elements where we engage with um, communities beyond the university to, um, to bring the history that we study to, to other audiences um, and, and to show uh, why it's important um, to do so. Um, okay, so we hope that, that we can continue these activities and, and pick up again where we left it basically, not, not entirely. It's not that we had, didn't do anything through, during the last year, but it was a bit more difficult generally as it was for everybody, I guess. 
Um, so what is in there for you? Um, obviously, um, studying history is about studying history. So you want to learn about the past, I guess, and, and the ways in which it is relevant um, for the present. But you also want to, um, I, I guess, just, uh, improve your own skills um, um, and get skills that uh, will allow you to um, do whatever you want to do with your life and, and what you want to do um, after you've um, um, completed your studies at university. So apart from the contents um, of the histories that we teach, um, a, a very important part of the program is also to, um, to train you in these skills um, and, and maybe to, in a nutshell, the, the point of it is really uh, to, to learn to ask questions um, uh, and to find ways to answer them. Um, so this is why I'm studying history, exploring archives, collecting knowledge, um, talking to people, um, weighing opinions against each other, find ways to support arguments that you want to make. I mean, all of these things are really quite, quite crucial. Um, and maybe um, looking at the time, I just, um, the, the, the next three slides are a, kind of an overview of the structure of the program. And I think I, I don't really want to go into this detail now. If um, you can get the slides later on, have a look at it. And if you have questions about this in more detail, um, you can maybe ask uh, via email. So the point is really that you always have one part that talks about the skills that I just mentioned. And, and then we cover kind of areas in global history and then particular histories of regions you might have specific interests in. Um, and obviously the, the big, um, emphasis is on uh, allowing you to, to learn how to do your own research and, and how to create your own work in the process, uh, which then ends in the final year with, with your dissertation or other subjects. Um, maybe I leave it at that um, and um, think about your questions, keep them in mind. I, I would like to pass um, on to my colleague, Lars Lahmann, um, to give you more, um, kind of interesting and, and more engaging um, insight into what a history class might look like before we come to um, questions and answers at the end, I would suggest. Thank you, Thank you. very much, Andrea. It's um, always a pleasure to listen to your explanations about the purpose of studying history at SOAS. And of course, uh, if in the, uh, towards the end of the session today, um, people have uh, concrete questions concerning the uses of studying history, uh, then uh, this uh, will both relate to the structure of what we're doing and uh, the courses that we teach. Um, now, uh, one, if there's any one topic that um, dominated our lives last year, then it must have been the pandemic because um, there, there is <laughs> simply no uh, other event in my lifetime. And I have an uncle who's going to turn 103. And in his words, there's nothing, not even the Second World War, which was uh, um, as um, influential in his life than um, the um, period of seclusion and not being able to see um, loved ones and uh, going about uh, the, um, uh, you know, one's life as um, it um, uh, has been from birth. To you, now I've somehow lost the <laughs> slides, one second. Um, to you who have um, in essence been um, uh, brought up by your parents and then perhaps lived in various places um, uh, on your own. Um, this is certainly um, also a very important event. And this event is something that is actually um, experienced by all of us as being incredibly um, uh, restrictive. And this these restrictions come from uh, come in many ways. And I hope you can see the um, the. PowerPoint now. Um, I entitled it uh, Black Death in China, but strictly speaking, it's not the Black Death, it's not the uh, bubonic plague, it's the pneumonic plague. Pneumonic plague, it's the plague that affects the, the lungs. And um, this occurred um, 110 years ago in um, so 1910 to 1912, roughly, um, in uh, 
the northeastern parts of China. That part is generally known as Manchuria because it's um, also the cradle of Manchu civilization. But um, in uh, historical terms, this was the time when China was in the transition from being a uh, an empire ruled over by uh, uh, by a dynasty of uh, uh, emperors stretching back more or less two two thousand years. It's not the same dynasty, but um, the system had been in place for um, more than two thousand years at that point um, to a republic. And so, in other words, it's the beginning of China's modern era. And my question here, that's what Andrea, of course, referred to in the end, what do you get out of studying um, history um, anywhere on earth, anybody's history, and then also the history of specific places such as China, because you do so because you can follow uh, patterns in the developments, in the historical developments, but then also how people react, and especially um, how societies react. Um, and yeah, I'm going to start not with people, but with a, um, a little um, animal, uh, which was, uh, which looks very cute. And um, um, it's one of the original inhabitants of Manchuria, of Northeastern China, of Southern Siberia, the Tarabagan, uh, that's the um, Manchu word. Uh, Jumara is the um, Mongolian word. Uh, it's simply known as the marmot in uh, in English, but uh, you would confuse it with marmite if you grew up here, because there are no marmots where where we live usually. Um, this is something that is a very much um, in demand. The animal's fur is very much in demand in places um, in the northern hemisphere, and therefore the Siberian Manchurian fur trade is something that had come to. Um, to characterize the economic life of this region. Why am I mentioning this um, cute little animal? Essentially, because it acted as a host for uh, fleas. And these fleas, if you, um, I mean, since it's recorded, you can, you can enlarge it then. Oh, I could maybe enlarge it. Let's see whether that works. Um, if it does not work, you're entitled to kill me. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Uh, maybe not. Will it work? Yes, here yeah. works in class. <laughs> I've learned a few things during the pandemic. For example, to to run classes from uh, from my computer at work. Today I'm uh, in my computer in our kitchen, which is freezing cold. But it's um, uh, so. I hope you are all nicely wrapped up. Um, but uh, this is um, the. Uh, a historic picture of a flea, call it a historic flea, because this flea is um, uh, infected by a, um, a, a virus known as Yersinia pestis. And this pestis um, is, of course, refers to the bubonic plague. Um, but in this case, the plague was the pneumonic plague. So it was the lung plague. And the gentleman who you can see here um, investigating um, the um, marmots uh, which they had caught are in essence, um, mm, yes, that work, um, are in essence, oh, let me go back here. Uh, in the top, you can see a, a modern a flea, a more modern flea in uh, color, and everything that is black in the center is essentially uh, the virus. And if you have a, um, a, a flea that is infected in the same way, then they can transmit diseases. And in this case, it is the uh, a type, a subtype of the plague. Why is this important? Because like all the predecessors of the plague, um, it spreads like wildfire, it spreads like the plague, and it spreads along the sea routes. And here you have especially the, um, the, the southern coastal um, ports um, that are important, connecting China with other parts of Southeast Asia, with India, and thus with the Middle East and the Mediterranean. On the other side of the Pacific, also with the Californian um, seacoast. So, um, but uh, the historic uh, plagues 
they traveled along the Silk Route. And the Silk Route takes you all along north of the Tibetan uh, mountains through the Takla Mahan into the western parts of Asia and then all the way towards the Mediterranean. And you can see that uh, actually if you travel along the Siberian routes in the north, um, uh, this distance is shorter. And um, the, the, this was another route for the plague to develop, for example, when the Mongols moved westwards. So um, this is the historic picture. So in other words, any local um, uh, epidemic can very easily turn into a pandemic simply by traveling along the trade routes. And by the time of the end of the Qing period, so 1910, so Manchuria would be up here. That's the that, that's the region. And historic Manchuria also includes this part, which is the um, Primorsky Krai, which is the um, uh, the province belonging to uh, Russia, which was annexed in 1858, and uh, still belongs to the Russian Federation. Vladivostok is uh, one of the is the principal port here. Um, so uh, in this region, you have a, um, a, a high concentration of uh, traders who interact with the rest of the world. And um, if you have a, um, a, a plague that uh, originates here, um, the, it can very easily spread into Korea, to Japan, but then also along the trade routes into Central Asia and uh, into Russia and further on. Um, this was the main threat which the, um, uh, the virologists, you could say, uh, thought so. And they began to make a um, comparison between, or they, they, they started looking at the lifestyles of the um, uh, people who worked as um, settlers, as uh, hunters, and as also as agrarians. And they found out that these people lived in very crowded conditions. And this is something that you will remember from the um, all the government um, information that you get on COVID that you should leave at least two meters distance, always air your rooms and so on and so on. And, and this is something that um, for the first time was actually being turned into applied science. And this science is medical science. And I'm going to, uh, so here you can see the, the sleeping quarters and eating quarters of the, the people involved. Um, um, the people who worked uh, in these um, uh, as medics in these uh, conditions uh, were more or less volunteers. Of course, they got paid, but uh, they um, were prepared to sacrifice their lives. Um, here we have the principal um, plague fighter. That's uh, an epithet that he later got, Uliandor. Uh, he goes under different names because he's, um, his family is originally from uh, China South. Um, so in um, Chaozhou and in uh, Cantonese, you can you get these other renderings. Uliandu uh, uh, is a, a different type of romanization of the Chinese characters that you can see. Wu is the family name. So Wu is uh, the surname, if you like. Yendo is his personal name, um, and uh, he lived, um, if I can move this, um, no, I can't, oh, whoa, whoa. so um, uh, he lived from the end of the uh, Qing period uh, right into the, uh, the Republican era, and uh, the, the perhaps surprising thing is that he uh, decided to work for his country, although he was actually the national of a different country, namely he was Malaysian. Malaysia at that very point was administered by uh, the British colonial enterprise, um, uh, although uh, in the area you always have the Dutch who controlled most of the southern parts of the um, uh, of um, the uh, Indo-Chinese, so-called Indo-Chinese uh, uh, islands, um, namely Indonesia. Uh, but um, importantly, we have a, um, a, a system that is based on family networks that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, at that point, roughly a thousand years. And um, uh, Uliandor is part of this uh, uh, network of Chinese uh, traders, and he uh, uh, feels the outbreak of this um, um, of this illness 
as a personal and as a national challenge. <clears throat> educated, he was educated in modern scientific medicine in Cambridge, at that time, one of the leading centers of um, medicine in, um, uh, in the world. But medical science, keep that in mind, was less than a gen generation old, also in the West. So this is the cutting edge of medical science. And uh, this uh, patriotic and adventurous young man goes northwards in order to try to help the, um, um, his compatriots in Manchuria. So what does he try to do? First of all, he's trying to intercept the hosts. And the hosts are these cute little marmots that you see in the beginning. Uh, by means, by very traditional means, these are traps. Um, and the traps you can also use for uh, Arctic foxes, uh, for um, uh, not, not for bears, but for, for uh, sm smaller rat type creatures that also have uh, uh, beautiful furs, they're known as minks. Um, and um, uh, all of these are perfect hosts for um, viruses. Minks, they also came up in the context of COVID, if you remember. And uh, this is, so if these are the um, uh, tools that trappers use, down here, you have the boxes in which the um, uh, the marmots are being stored. And uh, keep in mind that this is, um, although it's fairly uh, cold territory, at the same time in the summer, uh, it can be, um, for a few weeks, it can be really, really hot. So what you get here is a, um, a very, um, well, um, I don't know how well you can see it, but it's these are black and white pictures of one living and one dead uh, marmot. And uh, these are basically specimen. And these are being uh, uh, I investigated for medical research. And now something happens, namely Uli Endor, he decides that um, this disease is being transmitted uh, in little globules, namely in drops. So what is his solution? Essentially, to wear a mask and to get everybody who is in the vicinity of these marmots to wear face masks so that they don't transmit um, uh, these drops. So the cold jar, the face mask, which um, we are all familiar with, with by now, um, that was quite different about a year ago. Um, uh, this goes back to um, the, the, the public use during uh, epidemics, goes back to the uh, Manchurian plague of 1910. So here you can see Manchuria at the crossroads. Uh, down at the bottom, you have the traditional, um, uh, a traditional yurt. Let me see, uh, let me try to enlarge this. Uh, this is the um, uh, accommodation, which uh, the temporary accommodation, because it's always temporary. These are nomadic uh, uh, populations who use them, um, mostly Mongols. And um, uh, one of the beauties of uh, SOAS is that you are never really sure where in the world you are. Um, so um, one of the features that you get in the summer is that uh, all of a sudden a yurt uh, appears out of nowhere and uh, is uh, being established in the, um, uh, on a, a field on a little grass plain uh, opposite SOAS usually. Um, you can look at that, you can go inside. Um, I, I don't actually know who uh, who owns the yurt, but it's always there. And then you have other um, uh, uh, public weeks um, uh, devoted to animals of transport, beasts of burden, uh, like um, uh, donkeys and camels. So being at SOAS is um, an unpredictable um, uh, experience. Up here, you have the bearers of modernity, namely modern science. These are the scientists who come as part of an expedition. This time, it's a Russian expedition. And the, these Russian scientists, who so you can see there, they arrived on the Trans-Siberian Railway, on the Trans-Manchurian uh, extension. In other words, these are very much uh, at the forefront of the um, uh, investigation into the diseases. 1911, July, so this is in the dying days of the uh, of the Qing uh, Empire. Uh, if you study politics, uh, of course, um, it's a little reminder that the uh, that we're in the age of imperialism, and that at no point in time, people were safe from uh, in China, people were safe from the grasp of France, um, Britain, the Netherlands, um, 
um, Russia, um, because there was always um, the idea that they could extend their empires by carving out small pieces of China. Uh, so uh, this is one of the last pictures. Um, it just shows to goes to show how closely related, um, how closely linked the area where you had the outbreak of the um, uh, Manchurian plague, uh, pointed in yellow, uh, it was to the um, uh, trade routes of the time. And here on the right, you can see a waterborne trade route, namely the um, uh, one of the ports on the Amur River. And um, on, on the left, I don't know how clearly you can see that. Uh, you can enlarge it later if uh, since this is recorded. Um, you have China here, you have Mongolia over here, you have Russian territories over here already at that time. So Vladivostok goes down, uh, all the way down and then you have Manchuria sorry, Korea uh, developing, um, sorry, extending uh, south uh, eastwards further down. So th this is all connected through river transport, but also through train transport. So very easily had Ulyandor and his, uh, uh, his uh, people not managed to um, uh, contain this, um, contain and fight this uh, epidemic, it could have turned into another epidemic. Uh, seven years before the so-called Spanish plague, uh, Spanish plague. So um, uh, the Amur River. If you're interested in um, uh, Northeast Asian minorities, I can help you with that. Um, there are uh, Soas is one of the few places uh, on Earth where you can study Manchu, for example. Um, and this is, I think, the last picture. Um, so not just could this disease have spread throughout um, the, uh, along the trade routes throughout Asia, but also into China. And of course, uh, this is a picture of uh, a map of Beijing in 1911, uh, last year when it was the uh, capital of the Chinese uh, empire, the Qing empire. Um, uh, here divided into two parts, the Chinese uh, uh, city and the the so-called Chinese city and the so-called Tartar city, so it's the, um, the Manchu Mongolian um, uh, precincts of the city with the, uh, with the forbidden city in the center. So had the disease spread throughout China with its uh, then already enormous population, uh, you would have seen a, um, a, a disaster without any comparison because um, the um, pneumonic plague um, uh, would have needed to be restricted in the same way as in sparsely populated Manchuria, but that was really not possible at the time. Also, because China was not governed effectively by any government after 1911, um, uh, at least until the communists come in 1949. So in other words, if I would were to sum up um, the, um, the, um, uh, the essence of today's lecture, is that uh, epidemics, if they're not contained by courageous people who make use of the latest science, um, uh, spread uh, with an ease that uh, easily um, shadows that of COVID-19, even in times when travel was not as widespread. Um, uh, so uh, follow the science, follow the um, uh, historical evidence that we have, and come to SOAS and study history with us, because it would be a great pleasure to introduce you to some of the things that we have done re research in and that we take great pleasure in teaching. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lars and Andrea. Um, we've now got time for a Q&A. So if anyone wants to ask a question, um, either in person or via the Q&A button at the bottom, please go ahead. Um, yeah, opening the floor. Oh, uh, Andrea, okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> That's the... In normal times, it's one of the obvious places. Yes, that's true. So um, let me just see. I go into the chat. Sorry, I realized I sent it to the wrong address again. Then. So yeah. if you, Lars, if you look at the bottom on the Q&A section, we've already yes. had two questions. Yes, uh, I'm trying to oh, okay, so. my way up here. Um, uh, okay. whoa, whoa, whoa. 
So how, um, how, how are the lessons taught is the first one. Um, mm -hmm. Seminars or tutorials, that's a really great question because at the moment there are people um, thinking about how the current experience with online teaching might have an impact on how university teaching will be done in the future. But the, the standard format is probably, it's, it's actually not, not a straightforward answer because in the core module for the first year, for example, this is entirely small group seminar teaching in groups um, of around 15 to um, 20 students at most. Um, but most other modules would normally be taught in a one hour lecture plus smaller tutorial groups of, of an, that, that where you have another hour to, to discuss the material that was covered. Yes. Um, Lars, would you want to move on? I, I don't want to monopolize. Yes. Anna, that, uh, I, I can see that you're referring to a comment, but I can't see it. <laughs> Could you just read out the comment that you that, that, that Oh, you I see. see. Okay. Yes. I, I, okay. The, se the second question, if I, if I see yeah. that correctly, is how does historic knowledge positively impact society? And I think that's a fantastic question, really. And it's exactly um, one of the things that, that, that we're working on in terms of how, I mean, this is why I say we, we try to uh, connect to communities outside the university and try to bring other groups into the university to have this this to, this conversation going really. And I mean, at the moment, the thing that is most at the heart of this is is probably I mean, this this year was um, tremendous in that respect. Obviously, you had the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, that's that's very much at the core of what many of our colleagues are doing. Uh, so it's it's a big question that is very hard to give a very brief answer to, but it's 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 one of the things that is at the core of the interest of I think so as, as an institution really, and and history is part of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and oh, yeah, yes. So it, I I just want to um, uh, uh, just reiterate what Andrea said right now. I mean we are, we we, uh, we live for that. You know this is. Um, um, our it's not just a job. Um, th this is actually our mission, if you like. Um, um, we, we whenever there is a new event, whenever there's a new movement, whenever you have uh, historic um, changes that take place, we, we try to um, uh, bring uh, the, the the context closer to to our students. And not just our students. I mean, one thing that we, we should actually, um, I mean, that became clear when um, Andrea put the, um, the titles of the books that um, our colleagues published here. Um, the, one thing that became clear is that our teaching actually is directly um, uh, derived from our research. So uh, what we do day and night and uh, in, uh, uh, in, in places uh, that, that are far away from SOAS and in our own archives, um, we, the, what we come up with there is actually what we teach. And um, in uh, sometimes indirectly, sometimes extremely directly, just straight out of our research. So this is um, uh, one way of connecting with um, history, if you like. So where, where life and history interconnect. Uh, yes. So there was another question, Lars, about um, year abroad. Uh, are students able to go on a year abroad if they're only studying history, or is it only if you're doing a joint degree? Uh, you, no, you have to do a joint degree with a language. Um, only then is, uh, is it actually integrated into the uh, into the program. Uh, I mean, there is the possibility of. Um, Normally, I would have said uh, Erasmus, but um, the, the, um, the, that's just been uh, axed by. Uh, I'm not becoming political now, but um, it's um, uh, yes, that, that's not possible at the moment. Um, the, uh, there are bilateral exchange programs that you can subscribe to, but then you would have to organize it yourself. We can help you with that, but it's um, it, it's definitely um, something that you would have to take a year out. And then rejoin the program. So it's not part of your, your history course as such. And this will probably have to be our final question because we need to wrap up um, 
fairly soon so the next session can get going. So how flexible is the course and can you decide what areas you're interested in? Andrea. <laughs> I actually start, just started typing an answer to that. Um, there are core modules for each year that you have to take and there, there are compulsory modules um, where you have to take uh, one or two from a particular list of modules. So, so there is a bit of flexibility um, in, in this core part, but it's not entirely flexible. But then um, in each year you have the opportunity to take up to 30 credits, which would mean one module per term. Uh, so that uh, oh, it seems we've lost yes. Andrea uh, there. A too long list of open options from other departments. Mm -hmm. so, so they're open options. I think you cut out at the crucial point uh, with the open options. So there is oh, I'm flexibility. Sorry. Okay. There is oh. flexibility through okay. the open <laughs> options. But it's, um, uh, yes, uh, if you look at the, um, the um, uh, list which Andrea produced, it becomes, sometimes it says um, uh, it's like a compulsory course. Um, but then you also have a list of um, uh, optional courses within a compulsory mix. It depends which year you're in. Um, so, and then, uh, Third year is very interesting because uh, that's where you uh, write your dissertation and the dissertation is uh, you're completely free to agree on a topic with your um, uh, with your supervisor, supervisor who you choose. And maybe, uh, Daniel, if you just uh, answer our final question, uh, what is the workload like at SOAS for history and what's the work like? Uh, yeah, yeah I, was, I was just typing the answer for that. but. Uh... Generally, the, the workload um, is well spread. And um, what you'll find is that, uh, obviously, uh, throughout the course, there'll be essays that you need handed on time. But um, it, it, won't be, it won't be too much pressure. Like, uh, it can be quite flexible. And um, the only thing is that uh, there is a fair bit of reading. But um, usually, it's well spread out. and. Um, the, the work is, it, it can be interesting. I mean, if you pick modules that you're interested in, then uh, obviously you're gonna enjoy it. And yeah, I, I enjoy it a lot. So yeah, it's great. Good student. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lars, Andrea and Daniel. Um, if we didn't get to answer your question, um, we might be able to do some sort of email, um, maybe with some history staff uh, so we can get those questions answered and we will circulate the recording if you want to watch anything again um, so thank you everyone for attending and thank you very much to our speakers <laughs>